Well, thank you guys so much for coming, and it's great to see such a big crowd. And I, I, I hope you're all here because you want to spend your early evening talking about math and not because we're in possibly the only air-conditioned room in Greater London. Um, but I'm appreciating that and you all being here. Um, so yeah, I think it's good to start a math talk with a puzzle. So here's the puzzle. We're going to start with the puzzle, which doesn't look like a math puzzle at all. It is, what is this strange list of things? Like, let me let this, that sink in for a moment. Um, and then as we move on from this, so, you know, as Daryl said, like, I write books about math. I also teach math. I'm a professor. And, and I also, you know, write research math papers. And in all of those things, I think one thing that I've learned over the years, those things have in common is that they all involve really like telling a story about mathematics. That's how I organize uh, the books that I write. And so I want to sort of organize uh, tonight's presentation um, around a rather interesting story that I found out about while researching my last book. And it starts with this gentleman. OK, first thing I want to say, very important, you're not supposed to be able to read this text. It's a very poor scan from a very small article in a very old newspaper, uh, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch from 1904. Um, I hope maybe you can read the headline, at least, which says, Mosquito Man Coming. So um, we'll start with a little bit of photo ID. Does anybody know who this is? This is a hard one, I would say. Usually people don't get this. Uh, the hint is this guy is British. So I was like, maybe in this room, I'll get a positive answer. OK, no, I'll tell you who this is. Uh, this is Ronald Ross, who in 1904 was a major celebrity uh, in the medical field. He had recently won the second ever Nobel Prize for medicine. Um, and he received that prize. Now maybe we can get it from the headline. He had received that prize because he was the person who figured out the mosquitoes were the vector for malaria. Like that was how malaria was being transmitted uh, by the Anopheles mosquito. Um, why was he coming to St. Louis? Because this was, 1904 was the year of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, um, which was in honor of the centennial of the Louisiana Purchase, which for the real American history fans, you might know was in 1803, not 1804, but these things are kind of complicated to organize. They didn't quite get it ready by, by 1903. Um, so it was this sort of grand celebration where they bought, brought all manner of luminaries and dignitaries to St. Louis to sort of, you know, you know so to show that the United States was now on the map and that the major literary, scientific, and artistic figures were all going to converge on the center of the United States to sort of show that this was a real place. Um, Helen Keller was there. Geronimo was there, the chief of the Apaches. They, they rolled in the Liberty Bell, which I did not even know moved, but it was rolled on a train uh, to St. Louis. And, and Ronald Ross was there, one of the most famous doctors in the world. But here's something interesting about Ronald Ross. Um, he was sort of bitter. He never really felt like he got the recognition that he deserved. He spent much of his life kind of complaining about prizes he didn't get or things that weren't named after them that he thought should have been. Um, and I think part of his, what was going on with him psychically is that he never truly esteemed medicine that much, despite all of his achievements in that area. Um, what he really thought was good was math. And he was always kind of mad about um, not being in medicine instead of in that. Now, maybe I'll say a story I won't tell in this talk, but I just got a comment on Later, um, he thinks about epidemics, and he develops the main model of epidemic growth that we use today the, um, and, that we, uh, and that we heard a lot about like a few years ago. Maybe we don't have to think about it so much anymore, but this kind of uh, basic, what we would now call a differential equation model of epidemic growth. Um, but he couldn't do it by himself. He brought in his, Hilda Hudson, who was a well-known British algebraic geometer, and the two of them developed this Ross-Hudson model. So if you've heard his name, not in connection with malaria, it's probably in connection with that model. But that's, much, that's later in his life. Now we're in 1904 in St. Louis, and he's coming to give this talk 
feeling kind of peevish about it. And he writes in his memoirs, um, I, I went to give a talk to an audience of doctors. They were expecting a talk about medicine. And instead, I gave them a talk about mathematics that none of them understood. <laughs> and to be clear, he wrote this quite proudly. Like that, that was his, his goal. So this was the kind of person he was. So let me show you, let me show you a slide. Uh, from his talk. So let me tell you about the problem that Ross was interested in in 1904. Um, of course, once you understand that malaria is being transmitted by mosquitoes, you naturally have an interest in eradicating the mosquitoes. Um, but that is not a permanent thing because there's a lot of mosquitoes and they come back. So a natural question is, if you remove the mosquitoes from an area, how much time have you bought yourself? How long is it before mosquitoes re-inhabit the area that you laboriously cleared? Well, one way of thinking about that question is the following. Um, there's some slimy bog that you haven't cleared that's still filled with mosquito eggs sitting in the fetid water. And those mosquito eggs are going to hatch and mosquitoes are going to fly out from there and they're going to eventually make it back to your cleared area. So the question is, how quickly does a mosquito move? How far does it get from its birthplace in a certain amount of time? Well, one way to think about that would be to sort of somehow measure like how far a mosquito could fly in a day and multiply that by the number of days. And that would tell you the sort of like maximum possible distance that the mosquito could go. But that is not a great model of the mosquito. The mosquito, I mean, we're not going to go into the mosquito's whole psychology, but the mosquito is not a goal-oriented individual, <laughs> right? The mosquito doesn't have a direction that it prefers to travel. It doesn't have a place it's trying to get. So Ross postulated a rather different model where maybe the mosquito wakes up each day, flies a certain distance in whatever direction it likes, some randomly chosen direction. But then the next day, it starts all over again and picks a potentially different direction to go in. No memory of like what it did before. And it flies in that direction, and so on and so on and so on. And then its path is going to look quite different. Um, so what, what Ross is doing, this is a slide from Ross's talk, and he's showing you the mosquito is not doing this, right? This is what the goal-oriented mosquito would do, determined to move northeast at the rapidest possible clip. Instead, the mosquito is going to kind of take this more meandering path, which in this case actually ends up quite close to its starting point. And so Ross asked if this is our model for how the mosquito moves, um, how quickly is it going to move away from its starting point? Or is it going to move away from its starting point at all? Maybe it'll always sort of stay around the bog where it was born. That would be great from the point of view of mosquito eradication and malaria control. Well, that was not me. Um, but in any event, Ross did not go to St. Louis to present the solution to this problem because he couldn't do it. He was stuck on it. Um, he was able to do the sort of one-dimensional version where the mosquito could move only left or right, but he wasn't able to do the more realistic two-dimensional version. So um, this is what you did in those days when, um, when you had a math problem you couldn't solve. There was no internet, right? There was, there was no place to like post it. I, I want to make it clear for the younger people, I don't, I, like, I, I don't remember 1904. I'm just saying what I've read about. <laughs> I do remember when there was no internet. Um, um, so this is what you did. Uh, you would write a letter uh, to nature. And nature was kind of like, again, for the young people, like the social media for scientists, right? Where everything was posted and you would like look at stuff and like try to get attention for the thing you were trying to do. Now, Ross didn't write nature directly. He wrote to Carl Pearson. That's this fellow over here. Oh, I forgot to ask. Well, I guess his name was on the slides. So that would not have been a good photo ID. Um, this kind of intense looking dude, uh, was the, the foremost British statistician of his time. Uh, Ross thought that Pearson might know something about this. Pearson didn't know how to do it, um, but he was like, okay, I'll, write a, I'll, I'll post a letter in Nature, um, but I, I'm not going to say that the problem is about biology, because if I do, the mathematicians won't work on it. <laughs> and Ross said, that's fine, go ahead, that sounds like a good plan, do it. So, uh, so Pearson wrote this letter. Um, he omitted all mention of biology. You'll notice that he also omitted all mention of Ronald Ross. So it's 
So he was mad again, <laughs> because then the problem was Pearson's problem and not his problem. But um, so as you see, this one is pretty readable. So Pearson turns it into a problem about a man walking. Um, and indeed, he calls it the problem of the random walk, by the, uh, the name by which this process is known even today. And this is the, this is the origin of the phrase. Um, so what happens? It doesn't actually take very long for, uh, for Pearson's letter to get results and find a solution to this problem. In fact, in some sense, it takes about negative 20 years because what immediately happens is the physicist Raleigh writes in and says, like, come on, I know how to do this. I did this 20 years ago. I did it when, it, when I was studying acoustics. Um, and so Ross had the answer to his question, which, I mean, I don't have this on a slide, but if you really need to know, it's that the, uh, the mosquito diverges from its starting point at about a rate proportional to like the square root of the number of days. But we're not going like, to have any square roots in this talk. What I really want to talk about here, so already maybe it's somewhat surprising that this rather well-known mathematical theory, whose ramifications we're going to talk about over the course of tonight, starts in this rather unlikely place uh, with this question about mosquito eradication. But what's even more surprising is that actually around this time, 1904 to 1906, the same mathematical problem was being considered for many different reasons, by many different people, in many different places, none of whom knew anything about the other. So for those who like the history of math, this is a very common thing that sometimes the world is ready for a certain idea to be thought about. And we don't really know why, um, but this happens again and again. So um, who are we looking at here? Do we know? I think one's easier and one's harder. Who have we got? Good, okay, yes. So on the right, we have Albert Einstein. Um, and remember, this is like, now we're in 1906, so I get to use the young, hot Einstein. I always like to use him in <laughs> these pictures. He's, this is not the kind of like Princeton guy from later on. This is the very early Einstein. And on the left, uh, you have Robert Brown. And in the middle, we have sort of a little picture of a random walk. And I wanted to draw a little bit more of the meandering path than you might have seen uh, in Ross's slide. So um, Robert Brown is actually a lot before 1906, but he was the botanist who, uh, more than a century earlier, had noticed that if you have a little particle of pollen suspended in a drop of water on a microscope and you look at it, you see that that piece of pollen is like moving around. It kind of like jitters around, making a little path that looks kind of like this. And of course, naturally, he was very intrigued by this because he, his immediate thought was, wow, so somehow this pollen, which was taken from a living plant, even though I've pulled it out of the plant, it's sort of maintaining some of its vital principle. It's still sort of alive somehow, even though it's not attached to the organism. But, you know, he was a good scientist, so he was like, let me test this. And he put a lot of other different kinds of things and drops of water in his microscope. And he quickly realized that this couldn't have anything to do with some kind of life principle because it happened with organic and inorganic things too. He tried a bunch of pieces of plants, but he also tried like a piece of soot and like a piece of granite. And then actually, my, my favorite part of this whole story, if you read his account of this, is that as he's listing the things he put in the drop of water under the microscope, like he says, a fragment of the Sphinx. Like, like that was just something he had in his laboratory. He doesn't comment on it. I was like, okay, I guess he just had that. And um... Anyway, this, so this wasn't have anything to do with coming from a living organism. So what did it have to do with? And this was a big scientific mystery with a lot of conflicting theories. And one of the theories, which people, you know, some people believed and some people didn't, was that maybe inside the droplet of molecules, there were tiny particles, so tiny that the microscope couldn't see them, much, much, much tinier than the chunk of pollen, um, which were sort of striking the chunk of pollen at high speeds from every direction. And what would happen if that were true? Um, well, at every moment, let's say like every like 100th of a second, like something we can't see would strike this pollen and move it in a certain direction. But because those things were flying all over the place, every which way, it would be essentially random which way the chunk of pollen would get knocked and which way it would go. Um, so then the natural question is, if that theory were correct, how would the pollen move? And you see now that we're asking the same question, right? We have like a, a thing and a medium, and something is causing it to move 
in a certain direction, but that direction, that direction being chosen at random, like at, at regular time intervals or irregular time intervals or whatever, um, what would its behavior look like? Um, and so Einstein found himself doing this, the exact same piece of mathematics that Ross couldn't do and that Raleigh had done uh, to understand like what the motion of this particle would look like and observe that it matched the results of experiment. So this thing that Einstein did in 1906 was seen as um, a pretty decisive blow in favor of what, of course, we now know as like the molecular theory of a fluid. That there really are little things called molecules inside that droplet, which are moving around and banging into the pollen. So this is happening in Switzerland with no knowledge of what's happening in England with Ross and Pearson. Um, meanwhile, okay, how about this one? Who's on the left? Nice. Wait, who said that? Yes. That person on the left is not a 10-year-old foundling, as you might think from the picture, um, but is Louis Bachelier, who we now know is kind of the founder of mathematical finance. Um, probably, uh, yeah, maybe a, somebody who's here from XTX, they probably know <laughs> Louis Bachelier. Um, he's in Paris, knows nothing about what Einstein is doing or what Ross is doing. Um, he's a student of Poincaré, but actually he has an interesting backstory too, because um, he doesn't come from the kind of usual like elite educational circumstances that brought people into French mathematics at the time, and to some extent still do. Um, he was just like a guy with a job. He had worked uh, at the Bourse, which was the big bond market in Paris, and what he wanted to study was the fluctuation of bond prices. He wanted to study that from a mathematical point of view. This was extremely disreputable from the point of view of French mathematics at the time. You were not supposed to work on stuff like that. You were supposed to work on like celestial mechanics or like something classy. Um, and it's really to Poincaré's credit, I think, that he was willing to take this, this guy, Balchelier, on as a student um, because he had this like rather crazy theory that maybe the bond prices just go up and down randomly. And then, of course, you have a question. If that were true, how, they would, how would they behave? Can you, can you model um, how bond prices would look if there was no rhyme or reason and they were just choosing a direction to go each day? And again, he found that that was completely consistent with what he had actually observed uh, in his time uh, at the Bourse. I, a little now, I will say that unlike Einstein and, uh, and Ross, this work was not so instantly accepted. So he's well known now to practitioners of mathematical finance, but it actually was, I think it was probably until the 50s that people really started to get on board uh, with the way, with even, even the idea that bond and stock prices were things that there could be a mathematics of at all. So he didn't sort of start this field right away, but now he's considered a founding figure. And, he, and I would say now many of the ideas have become Conventional Wisdom, as the slide on the right shows, this rather famous uh, best-selling book that's been in like 600,000 printings or whatever, um, which is probably, I would say that this book is probably the reason that most people even know the word random walk because of this famous uh, investment book. Okay, so we have Bachelier in Paris, we have Einstein in Switzerland, we have Ross in England and St. Louis, none of them know about the others, but we're still not done. We're still not done. Okay, who have I here? So the hint here is that if you know another name for a random walk, it's named after this. This is Markov, the man himself. And Markov, I think of all the people who invented the random walk, I think Markov's story is actually the strangest. Um, because Markov, again, uh, in Russia, like unbeknownst to any of these other people, uh, was also developing this theory. Uh, and he was doing it to win a theological argument. Um, I actually, when I learned about this, I actually kind of didn't believe it was true. And I had to enlist like, a friend who reads Russian to be like, can you read this document and like, tell me that this is actually true? Because I feel like I'm worried it's sort of something made up by like 
uh, you know, secondary sources. But it, but it's really true. So Markov was a fervent atheist, and like Ross, just kind of a generally angry guy. In fact, he was he was known as um, as Andre the Furious. Um, because of how many extremely angry letters he would like sort of constantly write to the Russian newspapers about like everything he was mad about in society. He was, he was extremely mad by the way that, that Tolstoy got excommunicated and he felt that he too should be excommunicated and he launched like a long campaign to get the Russian Orthodox Church to excommunicate him, which they finally did, but then he was mad because he was not anathematized, which was like an even higher level of expulsion than being excommunicated and that he could not, he could not get. Um, but he had a rival, Nekrasov, who was as devout as Markov was atheist. He sort of came from like a long line of Russian Orthodox prelates, but he was also a mathematician. He led a rival mathematical school. Um, and Nekrasov believed that he had written a proof that the Russian Orthodox doctrine of free will was correct based on probability theory. He wrote a 300-page treatise about it. I'm not going to try to explain exactly what the Russian or the Orthodox doctrine on free will is, because I don't fully understand it. Um, but let's just say that it does posit that there is free will. We'll take a note further than that. Okay, so why did Nekrasov think that he proved this? Well, he reasoned as follows. He was like, well, we know from this famous theorem of Bernoulli that Independent events settle down to statistical averages. The central limit theorem, if you like. I mean, this is what the sort of founding theorem of probability, that if you look at things that happen out in the world, um, obvious things like flipping a coin like 100 times, it'll sort of like, the more you flip the coin, the more it will tend to settle down to 50%. Um, that's sort of classic probability, but also, you know, all determinants of human behavior, you know, you look at like age of first marriage or age of birth and death or percentage of male and female births, like all of these kind of things, you look at them and they settle down to rather predictable statistical averages, like a basic fact of demography that we know. And he said, well, we know that that arises when events are independent. So people must be independently making their choices in order to arrive at, I, it, it might make more sense in Russian. I don't feel like it's that <laughs> convincing. But he was very convinced and he wrote a very long article about it. And this Markov absolutely could not tolerate. He was, he was happy to sort of have theological disagreements with people. That he could stand. But that somebody would sort of dress it up in the language of mathematics. This was completely unacceptable to him. So it's like, this I have to refute. Um, and this for real is how the Markov chain is invented. Let me sort of, let me show you. I'm going to sort of simplify it to bring it back to the mosquito. Um, so this is a much, much simpler version of Ross's model of mosquito behavior. In this world, there isn't the whole landscape that the mosquito can move around in. Um, there's just two bogs, bog zero and bog one. Um, and let us imagine that, you know, the mosquito is like a, this mosquito is like a pretty inertial kind of being. Like most of the time it sort of stays where it is. If it wakes up in bog zero, 90% of the time it's gonna stay in the bog zero the next day. But maybe 10% of the time, for some unknowable impulse will seize it and it will fly over to bog one. Now bog one, maybe somehow, I don't know, it's like a little less fetid, like a little less swampy. The mosquito somehow likes it a little less for whatever reason. So maybe there's actually twice the chance, like a 20% chance that the mosquito will fly back to bog one, sorry, sorry, fly over to bog zero if it starts at bog one. So this, and so this is a complete model of this mosquito's behavior. And in fact, what Markov showed is that for a system like this, this mosquito will actually settle down to a very predictable statistical average of how much of its life it spends in bog zero and how much of its life it spends in bog one. Even though, and here's where Nekrasov's 300-page treatise falls apart, it is certainly not independent where the mosquito is one day and where it is the next day. That's completely not true. It's much more likely to be tomorrow exactly where it is today. So by this method, um, Markov showed that Nekrasov's thesis was completely wrong, that sort of this settling down to averages did not imply independence. And in fact, he showed a whole class of systems which all, which were, had no, no form of independence, um, but which displayed this behavior, the class of systems we now call Markov chains 
or Markov processes. Um, and again, this is all happening in just around the same time, like 1906. Somehow it's in the air, right? So this is a great theory, and Markov did not stop here. Now we are moving forward a little bit in time. Um, he still is thinking about these processes, and I, I'll, I'll say this, the one thing that Russians can all agree on, like whether they're atheists or religious, is the poetry of Pushkin. Like that they can all, okay, that's great, we all are in favor of that. So I, Markov did something really strange. Um, he's like, let's apply the same picture to Eugene O'Negan, this great verse play um, of, of Pushkin. And he by hand wrote out the first 10,000 letters of this, of this play in Russian. And he asked himself, well, what if I treated this like the mosquito in the bog? But instead of two bogs, there's two kinds of letters, consonants and vowels. If one letter is a consonant, what's the chance the next letter is a consonant? Well, we can like literally count, right? We have 10,000 letters right now. We can see how often was a consonant followed by a consonant. And he did exactly this, and he got a picture that looked a lot like this. That if, if, if you are at a consonant, the next letter would be a consonant about one-third of the time, and it would jump to a vowel about two-thirds of the time. If you were a vowel, I guess the vowel is like bog zero in this situation. Oh, no, no, the vowel, the vowel is different, right? The vowel, you're very unlikely to have a double vowel. It's much more likely you're going to jump to a consonant next. So this was the result of Markov's analysis of Eugene Onegin. I mean, it's not much of an analysis, right? I mean, this is an extremely impoverished picture of what's going on in that play. I think we'll all agree. And yet, and yet, he did the same thing with another text. I'm sorry, I didn't write down the name, but it was a novel by a different author and found different numbers here. In other words, this extremely impoverished picture involving I was going to say four numbers, but the but you know you may note there's really only two numbers here, right? Because the 33 determines the 66, and so on. So really, just these two numbers are enough to distinguish like two different Russian authors. It's a little weird and surprising. Um, so we're going to jump forward in time yet again. Oh, good, it's blackboard time. Okay, good. Um, We're about to do the audience participation part of the talk. Let me explain to you where we are. Um, we're now jumping forward to the 1940s and Claude Shannon. Uh, that, okay, cool. <laughs> Woo! Clark. No, no, I mean, he deserves it. Okay. Um, so Shannon had an even crazier idea than using, than like sort of thinking of Eugene O'Negan as a Markov chain, taking an existing text and boiling it down to these numbers, perhaps in an attempt to distinguish one author from another, he was like, well, once you have the Markov chain, you can use it to generate new text. Like if I had to here, I'll go back one second. If I'm here, I could just sort of start to make a string of, if I'm a consonant, what should I do next? Oh, I guess maybe I should put a vowel. Maybe I'll have to go to another consonant. If I roll the dice and get 33%, maybe I'll put another consonant. I mean, I can, I can do this, right, and generate some long string of C's and V's. Probably wouldn't look, look much to you like Eugene O'Negan. <laughs> um, but Shannon thought of a way of, and, and this is called sort of Shannon's game, a, a way of doing the same kind of thing, but in a little bit more of a sophisticated way. And honestly, rather than explain it, we're just going to do it, and then you're going to see how it works. So, I, so I'm going to get my pen, and we're going to write on the board, and here's what we're going to do. I need everybody to have some source of English text. So if you have like a, a book or a paper on you, that's fine. Or if not, you can just like open your phone and like pull something out. This is the one time you're allowed to look at your phone during my talk. So let me let, me let everybody get a source of text that they can look at. Um, and this is a game, there's various forms of it, but this form of it is going to be about what are called trigrams, which is just a fancy word for three letters in a row. Or maybe I should say three characters in a row, because a space counts as a, as a letter. Um, so here's how the game works. I'm going to start with two letters, and I've decided to start with S and T. And then I want 
all of you to look in your text to see if you see an S followed by a T. And if you see it, if you're first to see it, I want you to tell me what letter or what character comes next, whether it's a letter or a space. Oh, I've already got one in the back. S-T-O, okay, great. Now we have S-T-O. And now what I want you to do, that's our first trigram. Now, look for a T-O. To complete this trigram with a T-O something. What do we got? Okay, S-T-O-W, okay. Let's find an O-W and tell me what comes next. Okay, I, I, I think I heard N. I heard an N and a C at almost the same time. Okay, oh, and this might be a challenge. W-N, okay, look till you find a W-N. A space, okay. Space, so now, this is a good challenge. Now we have N space, which means you need to look for a word that ends with an N and tell me the first letter of the next word. Yeah, A, okay. Okay, so now we have a space A, so I need a word that starts with A and what's the second letter? No, you already did one. S. S, okay. Okay, A, S. Space, okay. So now write a word that ends with S, first letter of the next one, because I've got S space. Okay. So space T, so I need a word start. Okay. T-H. Mm-hmm. H-E. Okay, cool. So now I need an E blank. Uh, so I need to find a word that ends with E. What's the first letter of the next one? I. Okay. Space I, so a word that starts with I. What's next? Okay. Um, okay, so... Oh, interesting. Now we need a word that ends with I, and then what follows it? Okay. Space E what? Okay. Um, e L. Okay. L O. What's that? OEV. Okay, now I'm curious. What word has, where do you find an OEV? <laughs> um, no, let's leave it at this. Okay, so what have we got here? Let's sort of stop and look at what we made. Um, stone as the I Eloev. Um, this part, by the way, when Shannon did this, this, the process he describes is he would just be in his library and he would just like pull out a random book and like look for the biogram. I feel like with this many people, we can do it a lot faster actually than Shannon did it. Um, so I hope what you're seeing is that this is not quite making English, but it's making something that has something in common with English. Right? It has certain of the features in English. You would, you would know that this was done with English text and not certainly not like Russian text with a different character set, but you would also know it didn't, I think you would know it didn't come from French or Spanish or another language that used the character set. And in, in his classic paper that sort of founds information theory, there's this famous quote, in no istlat way, cratic floor bears grossed pondinum of demonstrators of the reptigen is radioactina of cray. <laughs> Which was sort of Shannon's produced text that he made like by this process. I love, I, I, I've, you probably can probably tell I've recited this poem a lot. Um, and it's fascinating to look at this and see that it clearly has something in common with English without being English. This purely mechanical process that we did, which is sort of estimating some kind of much more complicated Markov chain where instead of just two things, a bog zero or a bog one, or two types of letters, a C and a V, I mean, the number of things involved is instead of all trigrams, all sets of three characters in the English language. So it's much bigger, but it's the same thing. It's just a bigger version of the same, and this purely mechanical procedure can make stuff that look like this, which is pretty cool. And now, actually, did you forget there was a puzzle at the beginning? Now we're ready to answer the puzzle. Um, so the puzzle was something I made, where instead of using Claude Shannon's library or a bunch of audience members with their phones, um, I used uh, the database, happily, uh, very conveniently provided by the Social Security Administration in the United States, of all baby names given to American babies in 1971, the year of my birth. Um, and you can make 
up new baby names in the same way. In fact, there's a bunch of different things you can do that I'm not going to show you. Um, <laughs> if you look at the second row there is uh, the list we started with. The first row is the same thing, but if instead of doing sets of three letters, we've done sets of two letters, that sort of gives you like a little more sort of wildness and creativity, but it sounds a little less like real names, you know? Although some of them are pretty good, Tiendola and Barillon. There's like a, it's like a little Game of Thronesy somehow, like Madra Hadria, I think is my favorite one from that column. Whereas if you do it with lists of five letters, that's capturing much more information that's like from the original data set you trained on. And you see it actually kind of reproduces actual names, right? So if you have like S-U-S-A already and you like look at a list of names, you're almost certainly not going to find another name that has that. It's just going to find the one instance where it occurs, which is Susan, and reproduce that existing name. So, I'll, so the first three rows are to sort of show you how the output of this process looks different if you use different lengths of, of character sets. But also, you can do the same thing with different databases. And what you see is that if you do this with baby names given in 2017 or with 1917, it's not just that this process <coughs> can capture features just generally of how English phonemes work. It actually is capturing something of style, right? I think we can all agree that the 1979 list is more 1917-y, even though there was nobody named Wanda Liotoli. That somehow is a more old-timey name than Naviel with two A's, or Rayerson, or Naphtaline. I like that one especially. All of which are names you could imagine being uttered at an American playground today. Now, I did wonder, I, I wrote this in my book, which is written you know, in the United States, and I always do this for an American audience. So I did, I was like, I don't know if this part is going to land, because I don't know if you guys have the same cultural associations with names. So I did, over the weekend, try to redo this with a UK data set. It, there is not. I want to know how you guys think I did, because it, it, the data provided is not quite as clean. So, so th this is what I got. Tell me what you think. I did it with 2021 baby names, and then a, one from 1850. And these are all with trigrams. I didn't have time to sort of do it with. Um, so I didn't have as much data, so I don't think these are quite as good. But OK, so for all the actually British people, would you agree that there's a, di a difference in style and there's a 2021-ness in the 2021 names. Um, and, and actually, one thing I like about this, you can really see, uh, you can sort of see how it works. Like, I like this one I put it in the boys list of Edwarov. You can see it's sort of reproducing Edward. <laughs> But then it sort of switches. It's at the AR, and it's like, what should I do? And there's another name on the list, Arav, like A-A-R-A-V. So you can actually sort of see it switching from one name to another as it sort of is, I mean, because after all, the AR, it could do D or it could do A. There's probably other things it can do too. So with, with, with less data, actually, you can sort of see those artifacts a little bit more. Um, OK. Um, yeah. Ristensen, I think Ristensen was my best 1850 name of, of any of these. And Abigail 3, I like that one too. Um, okay, so let me ask a question. Now, now we're going to go all the way up to the present day. Um, we started, I, I just picked two letters to start with, right? I started with the letters ST. Um, what if, and now I'm sort of like slightly signaling where we're going with this by my word choice, um, ST was the prompt. What if we had chosen a different prompt? What if we had chosen WQ? If I'd written that in a book, what do you think would have happened? Yeah, exactly what's happening right now. You guys would have all been sitting here silently because you would have been scrolling through your phones looking for it. And at least according to one slightly disreputable website, there are only seven Bigrams that don't appear in an English word, and WQ is one of them. So you would like look and look and look, and you wouldn't find a WQ, and we would just be stuck. All the same, I think there's actually a right answer to what we should put next if we have WQ. Yeah, I think we should put a U, because we sort of know a rule about the letter Q. And you can imagine, well, maybe this is not a recognized English word, but maybe like a huge herd of cattle like ran by and it was so big that their hooves like shook the earth and it was like a cow quake 
and then maybe, I mean, you could imagine some situation in which you would, and, and I think any situation you would imagine in which you did have a WQ would probably be followed by a U, right? So, um, so, I, so I would say, even though the, the game, according to the rules I gave you, would stop, um, you should still say U. And so that kind of brings us into the present day. I just swapped my, so, so some, we need to do something a little bit more. Um, so this brings us to the present day and large language models, which are all the rage. Um, what a large language model will do um, is given some prompt, right? It sort of completes it. It continues the text from that point forward. Um, the, the, what I want to argue to you today is that this is really the same kind of thing as what I've shown you. It is a mechanistic process, and it is something that captures certain features that we recognize English text as having. It captures a lot more features than the things that I've been showing with you, but it's the same kind of thing. But there is one important element, which is that certainly if I give you like a paragraph and ask a large language model to continue from there, that exact paragraph, it's almost certain that it has not appeared anywhere, even given the vast volume of text that's been given to train on, that exact paragraph doesn't appear. So it's not like it's like looking for where did I see that paragraph before and what came next. It's doing something else that like roughly involves understanding something of like similarity. Saying, I don't see that paragraph, but where did I see something like it? And if I look at all the times I saw something like it, what happened next? So I would say that's sort of analogous to what would happen if we saw a WQ. We'd be like, well, I never saw a WQ before. But in things that sort of had something in common with WQ, I usually, I usually saw a U after it. So maybe I should do that. So that, of course, I mean, look, there's a lot of secret sauce in like what we mean by similarity. Um, but that's kind of what these things are doing. So I just want to close by saying a little bit about that, because it's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, lately. But always with this emphasis that what we're seeing is not a drastic discontinuity with the math that's come before. It's, in fact, an exact continuity with this story that starts in 1904. So maybe I'll just show, I mean, you don't have to read all this, but this is a, a paper uh, that came out this year that I wrote with a bunch of people who are, who are here in England, actually, people who work at Google DeepMind, which is based in London. It was actually, I got to say, like yesterday, because I'm in the country, like I went and met these people for the first time in person. It was pretty cool because we've been doing this work together, but always completely transatlantically and remotely. Um, and this was a project we did um, where we tried to get large language models to present us with something that was actually interesting mathematically. Now, let me hasten to say that doesn't mean that they're, I mean, doesn't mean that they're doing mathematics or thinking about mathematics. These are philosophical questions I'm not going to address. But you can imagine, let me put it this way. If you were trying to name your baby and you were stuck, maybe the thing I showed you would not be such a bad tool to have because it would generate things for you that you might not have thought of, but which somehow have the features that you're looking for. And so the hope is that we can do something like this for mathematics. And in this case, uh, what we would do, and this you definitely don't have to read, <laughs> but I want to tell you what kind of thing it is. If you look on the left, uh, you see a computer program. It's written in Python. Uh, that program was produced by Google's large language model. So we're trying to sort of get it to produce programs that do interesting mathematical things, essentially by having it generate a lot of programs, checking which ones do the best on some task that we want them to do, throwing out the 90% of bottom performers, and then sort of telling the large language, well, okay, make more like these good ones, then throwing out the bottom 90% again, and sort of keeping on iterating this process. That's an oversimplification. But basically, we're trying to train the machine to write programs that do a good job at doing a certain mathematical task. Again, for this talk, it doesn't even matter what the task is. I, but I just do want to report that it's quite fascinating to read these programs that are written by machines. They do look a lot like programs people write because, of course, that's what they're trying to imitate, right? They're, they are trained on sort of some huge amount of Python programs people actually wrote that are like out there in the world. Um, but you do find yourself reading these and sort of telling yourself a story like, oh, I see what it's trying to do. Is that real? I do not know. <laughs> but in some sense, it doesn't matter. Um, and we were able, in some cases, um, 
to get these programs actually sort of to get like good mathematical results that beat what people were able to get. Um, that being said, I sort of, I'm quite happy about this work, but I do want to sort of say something about the limitations. So um, this is what we know from this work the large language models can do. Um, well, basically what I just said, they can learn to produce a program. And I very carefully say produce, because I don't like to say like, create or write. I'm like, okay, they definitely produce it. We can all agree on that. That's not controversial. Uh, they can learn to produce a program that gives good solutions to an individual math problem. But what we can't get, at least so far, is a single program that gives good solutions to a whole class of problems, which is a mathematician, that's really what we want, right? We don't want to solve one equation. We want to have like a system that applied to any equation will work and solve it. And so far, what we have found is that this is what's called in machine learning the problem of generalization. So we somehow haven't found that the programs these things produce. They're very good at doing the exact thing that we trained them to do, but no more. It's, like it's still a one question at a time kind of thing. Um, so that seems kind of bad, but I want to emphasize that there is sort of an intermediate goal, which I think is much more reachable which is um, not that the program that the LLM produces will solve all our problems, but that the human looking at that program and saying, what is it trying to do? What is it struggling to express but cannot? Sorry for the anthropomorphization. And like, in other words, can the program give the human good ideas in the same way that a Markov chain might give you a good idea for a baby name, a name that you actually liked? But in the end, you would be the one picking it, right? You would be the one who that, that idea for a name kindled in something inside you. The associations you had with those, that name, why Madra Hadria sounds good to you, that's you. Like that's not the machine, which is just mechanistically producing stuff. So this I think is quite reasonable. And I would say that we've had like some preliminary success in this intermediate domain, which at least to me is like the most promising for like what these things, uh, are gonna do for mathematics. So maybe I'll just comment that given that we can't even get to step three, <laughs> I'm not immediately sort of so worried about the LLM eating all humans or even worse from my point of view, making <laughs> research mathematics obsolete. I feel like we're sort of still working on sort of trying to get to step two of this chain. So, but I do think, and, and sort of everybody, it's on everybody's lips. I mean, I do think this question of like, what do the Markov chain's distant descendants, what do they mean for creativity? Like, is Eugene O'Negan like just a list of consonants and vowels in the end? Is that like actually what it is? Um, I, I'm a believer in this kind of collaborative model given by step two. I like to think about, okay, who's this? Who's this guy? Good, okay, yes, I thought I would get it here. So this is David Byrne um, from, what's the, okay, let's, let's do a follow-up question. What's the, what's the still from? Okay, that, I'm going to count that as a yes. That's close enough. It's from the it's from the video to burning down the house. It's not in the movie, but it is from a song that is in that movie. Um, but rather famously, um, the way that the lyrics to this very famous song were written was, you know, they had written the music and then basically they played the music and David Byrne kind of like made sounds into the mic that sort of sounded like they went with the music. And then after the fact, they all kind of w gathered around and were like, what does it sound like David was saying? <laughs> so this is in some sense a sort of random process, but it's also a random process that's guided, right? It was supposed to sound good with the music. And I think this is kind of a model. I mean, this, this song, which in my opinion has like fantastic lyrics. I mean, I think it's a sort of a model for how these kind of random mechanistic processes can go together with our own ability as human beings to sort of filter creatively uh, to create good things. And, I, and I'm always trying to, add local color, I did it with the name. So actually for this talk, I found a new example of this, which I did not know about. There's kind of a giveaway in this, but can we identify who's being quoted here? Yes. So this is, uh, this is Tom York from Oxford's own Radiohead talking, which is why I put this in. And so I didn't know this, but actually one of the, it's, it's the title track of Kid A that he's talking about. And it was written in this exact, um, well, not, not the exact same way. He used a different random process. I, he had had this sort of a long period of writer's block in which, during which basically every line he thought of, he would put it on a piece of paper and he had a big, like a literal hat 
this is not a metaphor. He had a literal hat full of these little, little scraps of paper. And to write the song, he would sort of like pull them out and use the, the lines that he wrote. So in summary, because I feel like people ask this a lot, my sort of picture of um, where we're going with these large language models and maybe AMI more generally is that um, they're not magic. If, I've tried, if, I, if there's a takeaway from tonight's talk, that this stuff is not magic. It's a more advanced version of something that's, being, that's been being developed in mathematics for a long time. It is qualitatively, but not that, sorry, it's quantitatively, but not that qualitatively different um, from what's coming before. But I do think that is in no way to deny that this stuff is incredibly cool and incredibly useful. So what I like to say is that it's like less like magic and more like electricity. Like it's something that will probably be some of it in everything. Um, it is something that can harm you if you don't use it <laughs> correctly. But it's also something which, unlike magic, we actually can, over time, develop some ideas about how it actually works. Certainly at the beginning of electricity, we had much less of an idea than we do now. Um, and as such, it is something that we can uh, eventually successfully engineer. So um, th that's sort of the end. Let me just say that um, I'm not trying to be too commercial, but like uh, the stuff I talked about today, the reason I knew about it is because I learned about it while I was writing this book, Shape. Um, which has a lot about random walks in it and actually like a ton more than is even in tonight's talk because once I start learning about something I sort of like follow all these rabbit holes and get excited and like put like everything in there that I learn. Um, I thought I'd put up both covers because I always, I'm endlessly fascinated by the difference in UK cover design and American cover design. Is it obvious to you guys which one is the UK cover and which is the American cover? No! Wait, about from that's the American on on your right, and that's the and and every time for all of my books, like the UK publishers are like this American cover like won't do like this won't sell in Britain. So there's these very different styles. I don't anyway. So you can see the and and they've changed the subtitle too. I, it's very interesting. I don't I don't quite know why. Um, I love this American cover actually with the tree because there's a lot of trees in the book too. Um, and maybe I'll just sort of put the slide up last because when I write these books, and I hope you've seen it, this involves a lot of weird stuff with unexpected connections between them and to sort of keep myself straight. Um, this is kind of my governing diagram which appears in the frontispiece of the book, like the various things that the, books, that the book is about and sort of how they connect. And let's see if I can show you, let's see if I can find Random Walk. It's like right there's Random Walk. So this talk was just about sort of this much of the book. There's Carl Pearson, there's Markov, there's automated language generation. So uh, there's St. Louis and Ronald Ross. So I, I was sort of talking about this part, but as you see, it connects to even more stuff in the book that, it, um, that I didn't do in the book itself, I guess is like kind of a random walk through this sort of space of interlocking mathematical concepts. So I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you guys so much for coming out and listening.